conversation that's happening there around how, you know, how do we make sure that we're doing the right thing? Because trends are one thing, but we, you always have to be able to translate design and style into actionable, usable things, and we can't go too far off. Welcome to this special edition of the Fine Home Building Podcast, sponsored by Pella. The Fine Home Building Podcast is a regular discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by producer Jeff Rose, Jen Tutkin, and Nicole Willett of Pella Windows and Doors. Please email us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com com slash podcast. Wow, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks very much for being on. Thanks. I'm going to ask you uh, both. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm going to ask you both what you do at Pella first, and then we can talk about how many windows and doors Pella makes in a year, because honestly, I am very interested to learn. Nicole, do you want to go first? What do you do there at Pella? Absolutely. So my name is Nicole Willits, and I am the product manager for our entry door and hardware categories. I also co-lead our trends team. I've been with Pella for about uh, going on four years now. I've been with the the trends team and the product group this whole time, and I I do come with a background in uh, commercial interiors as well as design. What does trends team do? What does the trends team do? Oh, that's that's a meaty question to throw like right at the beginning of the topic. <laughs> I mean, our trends team is is many things, and I'm sure we can go into the depth of how we how we get to what we do. But we are basically a, a cross functional group that takes a, an interest in all kinds of different topics, from the highest you know humanity level topics to um, what is a pretty finish on cell phones these days. <laughs> we, we cover the gamut of that and really we, we kind of cycle those topics and find through lines so that it's relevant for our industry, for our marketing, for our content, and, and we build that up for recommendations. Hmm, that's really cool. Jen, what do you do? So my name is Jen Tutkin. I lead up our innovation and design team. And So similarly, I've been here about four and a half years now and have been really fortunate to work on the innovations that we've launched in the last four years, such as the integrated roll screen on the double hung, as well as the easy slide operator. And I also co-lead the trends team with Nicole. She's my partner in crime. And between the two of us, um, we just have a ton of fun talking and thinking about what the future of windows and doors, the role of the home, and really what are consumers looking for these days. Um, I come with a background. I'm actually an industrial designer uh, Mm, by degree and have, yeah. And I've worked on products, you know, for Target and JCPenney and Kimberly Clark and Kyocera, some really big names. So uh, mostly home decor, lighting, cell phone design. It's kind of been all over the place, honestly, but uh, windows and doors just started up about four and a half years. And, you know, it was really cool because they were like, hey, we're looking for a designer on our innovation team. And I was like, windows and doors? Yeah, they could get disrupted. Let's do this. So <laughs> jumped on board and have been kind of on the wild ride since. Tell me, honestly, uh, both of you, like, I'm sure uh, you notice windows and doors more often, commercial buildings, institutional buildings, all this stuff, right? Because I'm a carpenter. I notice the quality of fit and finish and trim and stuff. What surprises you? What continues to surprise you about seeing windows and doors out there in the world? I'll tell you, I'm a snob and I thought I would never care about the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I would ever be like, have an opinion about vinyl windows, but I do. <laughs> sure. And so I, I think, you know, your eye just gets triggered. And, and part of it is in just the solution when I'm in my home and if I have something that's nagging me and then all of a sudden you think, oh, wait. Like this is the key indicator of why I'm not using my windows in the kitchen. And and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about it and looking at what my neighbor's doing. And uh, it's unstoppable nowadays. I think about facades and coordination and 1974 paint colors all the time. <laughs> How about you, Jen? What do you notice? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, similarly, windows and doors for me in the past were, you know, 
probably a painted shut apartment window that was just frustrated and, and I never used it. Um, and ever since then I've become a total, total nerd for sure. I, uh, I think the thing that surprised me the most was getting into this industry though, just how much science and engineering goes into these products yeah. that are seemingly so simple which is they're so not simple you know there's not simple no no. they're so complicated but i think that's (laughs) sort of the that's the really nice articulation between the beauty and really the science where they meet for the home through these this kind of portal um and similarly to nicole too i think i always have kind of my researcher hat on as I am constantly just observing, like watching my grandma use her windows or, you know, watching my mom clean hers. And I'm like, God, it looks, it's so difficult. Like we could totally make this easier. And so my brain's (laughs) always stuck in like, how do we make this better mode? Um, But again, like that, that's what innovation is all about. So do you bring like windows as housewarming gifts to your grandmother? (laughs) (laughs) I'm not that person at a party. No, I, <laughs> I'm not trying to. Fix I haven't your done it. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. She actually, she has some really beautiful, like um, 1916 Craftsman wood windows in cool. their home. Um, so every time I go over there, I'm just always in awe of one that they're still in the home and they're like still in perfect condition, and just you know the simplicity of the old windows I'm always sort of just obsessed with versus kind of where we are today, where there's just a lot going on inside of them. I think you're not alone in that sentiment. I'm your <laughs> home is amazing. I mean, Patrick, she's got just, it's an interesting architecture. I, I think I mentioned earlier that Jen and I are both DIYers and kind of take, we'll take on, you know, the things in our home. And I have a 1926 craftsman that we've done comparison shots of like, Oh, that is what a window way is supposed to look like when it functions correctly <laughs> in original windows. <laughs> so, Nicole, are you ever tempted to replace those with something more comfortable? I mean, of course, it, it's, it takes a hit on the house, but, I mean, you must think about it. Well, to be fair, I'm working in the perfect melange of what is the thing I love most in a 1920s craftsman, which was original woodwork and all of the great stuff in, in kind of the most lived-in spaces, but also additions and a fire had happened and I am living with three separate competitors and in the vintage version of our own products. <laughs> I have plenty of opinions on plenty of things, but I have actualized opinions that are valuable uh, when I do get to come into lab and kind of be the touch and feel tester of, of different things. I love that you have your own like window testing lab in your own house. That's fantastic. <laughs> So how many, uh, uh, either one of you, how many windows and doors does Pella make annually? Like, and how many people work there? Where are they made? I'm, I'm curious about the, the, the manufacturing. Yeah, I'll take that one. So, I mean, just to, to give you the puts and takes of, of who Pella is, you know, we, we manufacture in Pella, Iowa. So that's directly in the Midwest. And we do exterior doors, windows. We, we have the ability to do a very customized platform, which takes a, a number that is both hard to conceptualize and also a bit jarring if you think about the production of it, but we can do up to 10 octillion combinations of units. So in sizing and options and things like that. So the customization factor for us is is pretty high, but we are uh, in our 96th year of manufacturing and, and we do go across a variety of material types. And, and we have 17 different manufacturing locations we do have a, a specific network to the Pella site, which is our PDSN, and that holds over 200 showrooms for us. And we sit at roughly 8,000 employees. Wow. That's a big company. Yeah. Still family owned. That's amazing to me. Yeah. My company is also family mm-hmm. owned, which is pretty cool. Indeed. So uh, you touched on it a little bit, um, both of you. Uh, windows and doors folks who are less familiar with the industry or having haven't had the experience of dealing with millwork think it's real easy but it's not and and things have progressed throughout time do you want to talk about like some of the innovation or how this stuff changes uh, in the industry that would be i think really interesting yeah happy to i can take that one um our, our industry is really interesting because we're constantly, you know, being driven to innovate 
on energy efficiency, on material usage, on the way that we think windows and doors should act or operate. Um, and, you know, Pella has a really rich history of innovation. We actually started in 1925 as the roll screen company. Um, and so we started making screens and then we decided to, why not build windows and stick the screens on them? And so we started building windows as well. And so we have had roll screens on our windows since the very beginning. Um, and as a company that continues to innovate, you know, we did the first blinds between the glass. Um, we did the first integrated roll screen, the full fold out crank casement window for some more space saving solutions. And so the industry is, it's kind of always changing. I would say the big innovations right now, we're looking a lot at, you know, how does sustainability play into our category, similar to all building industry, right? Um, how are we looking at usability in terms of how are consumers using the product in the home? Um, install, we know, is a very tricky situation for a lot of, especially replacement installers. And so really trying to understand that, hey, we can't just solve problems for homeowners, but how do we solve problems through the entire value stream of our product lines as we think about our installers, as we think about the sales team members, as we think about um, you know, the builders and the contractors just in general. So we have a lot of different people that we're focused on when we're looking at innovation and trying to make those decisions, but it, it is a fun space. Um, we've been fortunate to be able to launch innovations and win some innovation awards over the past few years that uh, I think really speak to our different approach than I would say some other manufacturers out there. So to, to be, Innovative, and I'll let you answer this, Nicole, or speak here too. But is is are there things you would like to do that the marketplace simply won't like buy? I mean, it, it, would you like to really shake up windows, and and they're just like, ah, no, no one's going to buy that. <laughs> uh, there's always that, right? Like, yeah. I mean, we we've got a bunch of creatives on our team, like creative designers, engineers, marketing team, and. You know, we've done some crazy things where we're like, hey, let's get augmented reality into our architectural design manual or, hey, how should wow. we be thinking about VR into our space? Um, you know, how do we bring these products to real life for people to visualize? But, you know, the crazy ones, of course, like we see, you know, glass technologies coming through that are, you know, transforming or they, they all of a sudden look like a, a display, a TV display. Right. And you're like, oh, that'd be cool. Um, but in reality, it's such a niche opportunity as a big yeah. manufacturer. And it's expensive, like, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, it's it, it's yeah. completely cost prohibitive, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, other than doing some super cool concept windows that just sort of say, "Hey, we're thinking about these things," and and we do take some of those out to our consumers for their feedback in terms of, you know, is this desirable for you? Would you be willing to pay it? Pay anything for it? Um, does it solve any problems that you existing like, currently have? Um, so those are some examples, you know, we've also talked about like, you know, the super wild and crazy ones where it's like, how do we make a, a screenless venting window? Right. And you're just like, what, how do, an air curtain, like an air curtain in a window. Are you <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll take it. Take... I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, let's do it. But like, what does it take to do it? And you're like, well, we got to tap into your electricity and we got to do this. And it might be a little bit bigger. And you're like, okay, too much, too much. Um, so th there is this like really fine balance, right. Of we love the wild and crazy, um, you know, 3d printed windows, right. Often usually come to mind too. like, Oh, could you ever do that and reduce waste or print them on site? And it's very, uh, I would say, compelling to think through those challenges, but not one we're attacking at a mass marketing level, mass manufacturing level. Chimes what do you think, on, Nicole? To chime in, though, I think there is this degree, too, when we start to activate. So from the product perspective, you know, we'll put something out into the market and Frankly, the, the build tells us what they may need. So different glass techniques and different install capabilities come through and they end up in our, our architectural services group who spends a ton of time like in the nuance of the project with the project owner and understanding how can we use something that we have? Can we use a different profile? Can we custom extrude something for you? 
How can we actually finesse the restoration project you're doing? There's this real nuance where we can't actually start to act, touch and feel scale that we would never get if we were even taking it to market to consumer insight. You're like, oh no, they're willing to, they're, they're going to pay it. It's a, that's a cool project that like I could have put in our system and feel good about telling a customer the price of it. But we do get to see it exercise and then you get to case study and, and give that line of sight. So it does help move momentum even in, in some of those niche categories as they activate and, and broaden in the market. One of the things that I would have thought tough to uh, get accepted in the marketplace was this new operator for your casement windows. Can, can one of you talk about that and try and explain it to our listeners who may have trouble imagining what that's about? Yeah, happy to. Um, I'll take the lead on this one, Nicole. So Easy Slide Operator is a new operator for casement and awning windows. And so if you look at the current well, formerly current uh, casement sort of landscape, the operator options you had were a push-out casement or a crank-out casement. And when we went out and started to do some research with consumers, we asked them, hey, you know, what do you love and hate about your windows? And it was a surprise because when it came down to casement and awnings, people really felt like the crank could, could be a little bit, you know, floppy to use or a little annoying. Um, it took too long to open and close the windows. It just, it was clunky and they didn't really like that. And so as an innovation team, we kind of stepped back and we said, Hey, you know, there's obviously a need for a better operator here. Um, and instead of just doing a better crank, could we do it differently? And so we started to ideate around all the different ways we could open a casement awning window that we didn't know existed today. And one of those was similar to, if you imagine like a dimmer switch, a longer dimmer switch on a window jam, um, basically you just put your fingers on this little knob and then you slide it up. And so it's called the easy slide operator. And as you're sliding that up a few inches, the casement is opening. And then as you slide it down, the casement is closing. And really, we took that out seven times, I think, for research and continued to be kind of a wow feature where people were like, this is so easy. I love how minimal it looks. I love how sleek and simple it is, how intuitive it is. They're like, it's like a light switch, right? You slide it up and it turns on, aka opens, slide it down and it's closed. And it became a real delighter. And you know, I just remember coming back to the team and saying, this is the preferred one. And they were like, but we don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's like, but that's exactly I, what we're here so to I, do. I want to know how you did it <laughs> because the, like the, the gear reduction in a casement window was how it makes it work. So, right. How did you make that so easy to move that lever yeah, into what I, could be a, you know, a two foot wide casement window. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen it operate a casement that's like four feet wide. Like it actually, the mechanical advantage that our team has thoughtfully engineered into this mechanism um, is unbelievable. And because what we also knew we wanted to do was we said, how do we also make it not just easy to slide open, but how do we do it thinking about design for inclusivity and usability? So can we actually get it to an ADA compliant amount of force, which is five pounds um, and or somewhere around five pounds? And we were like, yep, we're, that is our target. That is our goal. And that's what we're going to drive towards. And we knew that was a huge lift on the team, but they, they ran with it. I went back into our Pi Lab, which is kind of our innovation center. And there are Lego models everywhere where they are just trying <laughs> cool. to figure out how to turn the lineal motion into rotation and go around a corner. And they have spent so much amazing time and effort into making sure that mechanism works and it stands the test of time. And we've tested it above and beyond normal casement testing standards, which I think is like cycle of 10,000 times. Um, and the easy slide operator has been tested up to 20,000 and even with dirt and debris getting into it from a, a job site, um, we've been able to just really thoughtfully craft that mechanism and major, major kudos to the team who did that lift because, 
Um, it'll surprise you when you when you get your hands on it, Patrick. Uh, I want to hear your review. I would love I to your, try it. I actually I, I want to capture your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> it, we it, it's been a real pleasure to to surprise people when they use it well i can tell you that i was pretty skeptical when i looked at the animation and i'm sure you all have to have an animation because people like me want to see how this thing works right it's if you're a builder or a carpenter or whoever's installing the window you you need some familiarity with how this thing's put together i would say mm -hmm. yep do they like it are they worried? Are they worried they're going to have to replace it in a year? I, you know, our marketing team and our testing team have done a really great job of being able to be thoughtful and answer any of those questions. And our sales team members are prepared uh, with really great content and case studies and approved points. And we've had a few of them out in market for quite a while and have gotten really good feedback. And I think um, I actually, I, I got to see one, what I call in the wild, just two weeks ago, I was down in Dallas and saw it. And, uh, you know, the homeowner was just thrilled. They were like, you know, we, we didn't really know what to expect, but this thing is so easy. Um, and they're just really excited. And, you know, we're obviously with an innovation, we always know that it is a bit of a risk, right. To be kind of the first on the frontier to change the game. Um, but we were really excited and we feel really, really strongly and passionate about what we're coming to market with which, you know, when you think about the scale that we have to launch these things, there's a ton of testing and a ton of just making sure that we're doing the right thing for our customers at the end. And for the most part, everyone's been really, really receptive and we've seen really, really great inclusion so far. That's cool. It's, it's totally a cool thing. I am, it's the impressive engineering is uh, an easy way to put it. <clears throat> uh, do other modern like design trends influence how you all bring new windows or claddings or what have you to market? Is are those things you pay attention to? Do are there some things you stay away from despite their popularity? And I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I'll I'll take a, an initial stab at this. I, I know we we glazed over what our trends team does, but we have. I mentioned that a cross-functional group of people who are really looking at a main approach in the three ways that we talk about our trends. So we do a steep analysis, and that is, is looking at social, technological, environmental, economic, and political things that are happening. And then we, we also take those into essentially assessing how consumers are feeling and, and what are their emotional states of a topic. How do we think that they're going to um, express those, those states of, of feeling, and then how do we anticipate that they're going to, to, what are their needs out of it? And so, of course, at the end of the day, you'll find that often it never directly correlates to maybe what their ask was to what the solve may be, but the distillation and understanding of, of where we think their, their emotional states drive dollars to shift or where their interest may be is really kind of core of how we look at that biggest, broadest view. But then we are a team of, of creatives, and so we're looking at a bunch of different markets, and it's what our day-to-day -day work is, so looking at competitive, looking at our industry, looking at the things that are correlative in, in our merchandising and supply side of the business, but it's also looking at complete opposite and tertiary markets. So we're in fashion, and we're looking at automotive and, and advanced technology to see if there's interesting things to, to bring to gen and advanced engineering. Is there something that we could be doing that sales tool driven that we can take to our, our trade pro audience? Is there something we can um, create that's going to effectively do the right visualization that we know our audience would want to see? So it's a lot of different inputs that do derive what we call our, our mainstream trends. So it's what allows us to do a lot more of that consumer conversation versus um, forecasting per se. And where do, you, where do you look for that information, Nicole? Where do you, where do you, where do trendsetters look for trends, I guess, is the <laughs> easy way to ask that. <laughs> well, the easiest way to answer is we're content sponges. So we will we will take it from wherever we can get it. But essentially, the individuals are going to trade shows. We are looking at industry papers. We do white paper case studies for, for research. We stay aligned with the individual teams that we have, like I mentioned, our architectural services, so that we're informed of, of 
real live things that are happening. And then you also have stuff that you're getting in your day to days or magazine tear outs. And we all show up with big, thick binders full of ideas and stuff to talk about when, when we get together, which is um, we do round robins quarterly and, and really try and drive things to give good cadence for feedback and, and insights. And what that helps us do is give things like forecasts for color trends. Uh, we can talk about new additions to, to, to lines. We can try and talk about matte gloss finishes, but we can also ladder up things to when Jen mentioned um, the ease of movement and ADA compliance, we have this you know macro trend of, of housing crisis and staying in their homes longer and addressing those needs. So how can we relay those stories back in ways that are meaningful to consumers? Hmm. I bet they don't often know what they want. You have to tell them, right? Is that is that a fair statement? Sometimes we the best way to distill it is when our team really gets to the core of their problem to solve. And that rarely comes out just in a one nice form, but we have an amazing team that I mean they were just out this week getting getting insights and details that really pulls a huge amount of mind share that lets us kind of distill fairly quickly and how we can relay that. Jen, as a designer, uh, your, your particular uh, educational background has always interested me. I think that's a super cool job to be an industrial designer. Uh, where do you look for inspiration or creative uh, horsepower in, in your job? Yeah, great question. It, and it's a sponge. Like it, It's everywhere. I, I think I have just as designers in general, you always have a very diverse interest. Uh, you you love looking at like sailboats to the latest handbag, to the latest shoe collaboration that's happening in fashion, to the latest white paper. I, I just saw a cool thing um, on Fast Company yesterday around some silencing, some tube silencing uh, 3D printed mechanism. And it's just like, it's really everywhere. Um, but I, you know, for a visual person, I would say my content really comes from a lot of the media platforms where it's, you know, your Instagrams, your, uh, Pinterest, your magazines, you know, fine home building. I am a reader. So I'm always looking at you guys. What, what topics are you guys talking about? Uh, and whenever you talk about windows and doors, it gets a big circle. And I say, we need to focus on that. Um, and, you know, I even, the like, Building Science Fight Club, like, the dialogue and conversation that's happening there around how, you know, how do we make sure that we're doing the right thing? Because trends are one thing, but we you always have to be able to translate design and style into actionable, usable things. And we can't go too far off, you know, the reservation with the windows cool, and doors stuff. have to work, right? They have to keep out the weather and intruders at the end of the day. That's their job. It, Yes, absolutely. So it's everywhere. And I cannot wait for travel to occur again. I have to mm. tell you that, that a lot of inspiration comes from there, uh, as well as, you know, do you travel I think the cool internationally thing about, or domestically yeah. or yeah. Uh, if, if I can get on an airplane to somewhere I haven't been before I'm on, I'm on like, cool. let's go. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's anywhere and everywhere. I love immersing myself in different cultures because it, it turns you back into a child, right? Like you're in this area that you haven't been before. You don't know the language, you don't know the customs. And all of a sudden, like your little kid backpacker research hat goes on and you're like, why are they doing that? What is mm -hmm. happening? Why did they, you know, why is that style super cool to them? And it hasn't quite gotten here. And so there's, there's part of me, there's that playfulness that I really love about travel and definitely missed it over the past year and a half. But I would say the cool thing that did happen during COVID was, you know, a lot of the virtual museums and virtual trips you could take or sort of the yeah. Airbnb experiences where that I signed up for to take, you know, tours around Mexico city, <laughs> really, really fun things. So I, I and think the great thing is, you, you cool know, it now. takes a lot less time to watch it on your computer than it does to go to the airport and get on a plane and then fly to Mexico and then you know take the tour bus or whatever, it, right? It's it, yeah, exactly. Waiting for me <laughs> in my kitchen. <laughs> what uh, do you? Th so uh, some of the things we see that come into the marketplace are mistakes, both either in terms of function or design, I, you know, not everything works. Um, 
what do you think are the things we're making a mistake about now? Are these dark windows going to look really dated in a few years? Um, what, 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 what have you seen in the industry that you said made you scratch your head? Like, I don't know that that's a good idea. Patrick trying to get the hot goss out of us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody described it as the bus throwing part of the show the other day. So <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean, like, you know, what, 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 what don't you like, I guess is maybe another yeah. way to ask. I think that's a really good question. And I want I haven't gotten before. So kudos to you. It's a really unique one. Um, I think what I think about some of the stuff that's happening in the marketplace, the there's a lot of big, 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 beautiful doors happening right now. And a lot of vendors who do it and a lot of them that do it really well. But I think just a general concern I have is more around thermal efficiencies or air and water with some of them. And They're terrible. Just right? making sure that when you're choosing the, yeah, just making sure when you're choosing a product, you're choosing it not for the five year horizon, because we're talking about buildings, right? Yeah. And I think it's our responsibility too to make products for longevity, not for five year planned obsolescence in our space. And so making sure that when a product is going into the home, we, we take that very seriously. And we talk a lot about the responsibility we have as a manufacturer to deliver products that deliver on that lifetime. And so when you are choosing some of these bigger items that, you know, look really, really cool, but when that rainstorm comes through, you're mopping the inside of your floor. It, it's just a, it's a conscious consumer, I would say thing that, mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things that, um, you know, just worry about in general. Yeah. What about you, Nicole? I echo similar, similar sentiment because, you know, the mass expansive glass brings the, the views all the way to the floor for windows, which were never meant to be that way. Jen mentions it for doors, but just the practical applications and expectations of, of what a material can do versus the sight line that you want. Um, I think there's just a lot about setting, setting right expectations and making sure that they're thoughtful of it. The other part, I mean, you throw out black windows and, and forecasting and making sure that maybe we, we catch it and make how long of a life does it live versus if it's a fad. And obviously it's super mainstream, but it's definitely going to be a, a, a postage stamp footprint of this era of building in that sense, which doesn't mean a bad thing. It's just a, a very clear and pointed measure, which I find to be great. It makes a lot more dynamic exterior material stories and gives a lot more options. And I think that that's a really excellent thing, regardless of, of how it shapes maybe for the longest view of, of those type of windows. Those are both really good answers. Thank you. So what have we not talked about today that you both would like to discuss before we part company? Oh. Nicole, anything top of mind for you? You know, no, not right, right off hand. <laughs> yeah, I, that is the most anticlimactic way I to mean, wrap up the show yeah. ever. Man, yeah. Um, it should be a softball, right? It should be like, oh yeah, I got it. Um, no, you know, I think I think what we're I'm looking forward to the most is just things opening back up, trade shows happening again. Um, the just being able to get our new products in front of people to touch and feel is really really exciting because. Windows and doors, while we would love to say people are okay buying them online and not ever touching them, there's still a tactile experience when it comes to these products. And, you know, when, and we've, we've really invested heavily in terms of our, our showrooms, as well as just the samples that we create and um, being able to have that experience one-on-one -on -one with the products when you're going through that window and door buying experience is, is really important. Um, and you know, for me, innovation, we're going to keep on rolling. Uh, we've got a lot more coming, so I'm looking forward to the future, but can't tell you too much about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nicole, you were talking about, uh, the studio where Jen is recording from now. And is this one of the ways that you hope to, uh, enhance that tactical experience for your, your customers? Is that right? Undoubtedly. I can echo the same sentiment about trade shows and frankly, just hands on. And, and that's a huge part of what the experience studio is, is 
bringing people in, letting them touch feel factor. It, it's it's the product in real life in the best ways to show it and and then getting to go to where Jen is explicitly of that and literally build your palettes, which is a really exciting thing to do in the building that we hadn't had before, but also just a way to really re-engage with the product. Well, as you know, ahead of the show, I was fishing for an invite out there to see your windows and doors being made and the design studio. So I have it on tape. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to both of you. I, I've really enjoyed it. And I appreciate your honest and uh, informative answers. It's, it was a good show. Nice. Glad to be a part of it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. My sincere thanks to Jen and Nicole for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us. However you're listening, it helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening.